Hello everyone and welcome to Manta's Small Business Expert Webinar Series. My name is Ivy Lamb and I'll be your host for today's event, Smart Money Management for Small Business Owners. For small business owners, managing your finances can seem pretty overwhelming. Not only do you have to keep a close eye on the financial health of your company, you've got to do a lot of other things for yourself as well, like setting up your own retirement account. But you can take control of your finances. And today, we're going to cover some money management strategies designed specifically for small business owners like you. I'd like to thank Avalara for sponsoring today's event. So before we dive in, I want to cover some important housekeeping items about our event. During the webinar, you should see a slide area which will allow you to view the webinar. You'll also see three tabs, Ask a Question, Attachments, and Rate This. Click on the Ask a Question tab to submit a question at any time during the webinar, and we'll do our best to respond during the Q&A at the end of the event. Under the Attachments tab, you'll find more resources related to today's topic. You can go to Rate This to leave us feedback on the presentation, and you can tweet about today's event using the hashtag MantaExperts. Now, if you're having technical problems, please email webinarhelpmanta.com. Uh, my colleague Graham is going to be on hand answering any technical questions you have or if you're having issues seeing or hearing the webinar. Um, so again, please email webinarhelpmanta.com if you're having any of those issues. Now, we're going to move on to our presentation. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce our guest expert, Andrea Trevelyan. Andrea is a small business consultant who specializes in helping owners who want to grow their profit and then turn those profits into personal wealth. She has her MBA and undergraduate in finance and has been running her own successful business since 2002. She is an author, speaker, wife, mom, entrepreneur, and passionate guide for business owners who want to get to the next level and beyond. Today, Andrea and I are going to start by talking about some of the unique financial challenges small business owners face and why good money management is so important. Then, we're going to cover Andrea's five steps or best practices for small business owners including separating business and personal expenses, reviewing business financials, paying yourself, planning for retirement, and budgeting for yourself and your business. And of course, at the end, we're going to save some time for Q&A. So uh, just as a reminder, you can submit your question at any time during the presentation by clicking the Ask a Question tab, and then we're going to get to those questions at the end of the presentation. Okay, so we wanted to start off by talking about, you know, what's unique and what's different if you're a small business owner or if you're self-employed. So obviously, this path is really rewarding, but it does come with its own set of financial challenges. Um, Andrea, do you want to speak to what some of those challenges are for small business owners? I would love to. Um, thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, you know, I think the biggest issue that most business owners don't even take into consideration is that everything is intertwined. Your business finances and your personal finances are basically one. So you make a decision on one side, it impacts the other. And there's very few other people out there that that's the exact same story. If you're going to work for some Fortune 500 company um, and you make a decision at work, it doesn't necessarily impact your personal finances. It might, depending on your job, but they're so intertwined. And then on the business side, everything is self-guided. You don't have an HR team that's taking care of every single decision. And even if you do have like an HR person helping you, you're still the one responsible for kind of guiding everything and driving everything. And most business owners aren't finance oriented. So in addition to running the business, they're really learning this second language um, of finance. And then you flip that over to the personal side. And when you're trying to plan out, you know, your retirement or your, even your budget, 
all the advice that's out there is for that person with a regular nine to five job. So it can be really hard to kind of figure out which way that you need to go. And even when you reach out to a financial advisor or a financial coach, most of them aren't intimately familiar with business owners. So they can walk you through when to take your pension and when to tap your 401k and all this other stuff. But then when it comes to the necessary details of you, can you sell your business? And if you can, how much can you get? They don't know that too. So it's almost like you're on your own little boat in the ocean on both sides of the finances. Right. But we're we're going to throw out a lifeline in this webinar. Yeah. Um, and we're going to talk through some practical strategies and steps uh, you can take as a small business owner to kind of take control of those finances. So the first big piece of advice Andrea has is to keep your expenses separate. Uh, you want to talk a little bit more about that, Andrea? I would love to. Um, this is the number one mistake that I see business owners make on a regular basis. Um, even business owners that have been in business for a long time and know that this kind of needs to happen, uh, it's usually kind of put low down on the list. But this is critical for multiple reasons because it can hurt both the business and your personal finances if this isn't kept separate. Right. So um, just kind of some things that it impacts is like you have no clue what's going on on either side. So if you're intermingling stuff, it's really hard for that profit and loss statement that you're reviewing for your business to be accurate. It's hard to figure out if on the personal side, you're covering all your expenses or how much do you need to have saved up for when you do retire if all those expenses are over in the business it just it makes it that much more complicated to really dig into the numbers in addition to that the irs kind of likes you to have everything separate so if you ever get called up for an audit and they find all this little co-mingling of assets then they kind of go whoa it's a giant red flag and what can happen is if you're flagged for an audit let's say on the personal side, and they're seeing this intertwining, they can then start an audit on the business side. So it kind of creates this, it could be a very big issue. And then the kind of in hand with that is if you're an LLC or a company and you don't have everything separate and you don't have the right things in place for like insurance and all that stuff, um, then it can actually dissolve your protection. If you're not following what you're supposed to be doing, it can dissolve it. So that's a big one. And then also it makes it harder to sell your business. So if I wanna come buy your business and I'm looking through the financials and I see all this personal stuff on there, um, I, I need to kind of do even more work to find out what's in there. And the same time, that actually lowers how much your business is gonna sell for. So if you're, you know, lowering your profits to pay less taxes and taking personal out of the business, you turn around to sell it, they're going to go, well, that's expenses in there. And so your multiple is going to be lower because your profits were lower. Right. So a pretty compelling case there for making sure that you are very disciplined about keeping those separate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. So should we move on to your second piece of advice? I think so. Okay. The second piece is the review your financials weekly. And most business owners do not like to hear this one because they don't want to pay attention. <laughs> um, so here's why you need to look at these weekly. Your numbers are going to be the very, very first place that you start to see a problem. And if you're not paying attention to them, a problem can go longer and be harder to solve. 
However, when you're sitting there looking at your business financials on a weekly basis, you can catch problems with things like your margin or maybe your expenses are creeping up or revenue, whatever's happening. If you're actually paying attention to the numbers, you can catch those problems ahead of time. Um, and that's not just with like the straight P&L stuff, but looking at your numbers for like marketing. Do you, are you running an ad and all of a sudden it starts dropping off? Well, if you're not paying attention to that, it's kind of hard to catch it before it's, it's time. And with the personal finances, you might not need it always weekly, but this is also where you can catch problems, make sure everything's in line, and make sure you know what you need to get out of your business. So that's that's the hard one is to do that every single week. Mm -hmm. Great. And you also uh, have some recommendations on what our business owners should be looking at when they're looking weekly. Can you uh, can you define some of these for us just to make sure everybody knows? I would love to because this can be a complicated one. So you sit down with your books and you're like, okay, what should I actually look at? <laughs> um, the first one I actually recommend people look at is profit. And I always say profit because most business owners are so incredibly focused on revenue. But here's the problem with that. You want profit. Revenue is nice, but if you're spending everything that you're bringing in to even get that profit, then you're basically just adding work to get in more revenue and there's no benefit to it. Now, the exception to this is you have if you have a very strategic growth plan to move your company kind of to the next level but with this you really really need this to be like a, a set plan so you know for the next three years we're going to reinvest everything and that's going to get us to the point where we're break even and making a profit um, otherwise if all of, if there is no profit but you're only focused on revenue doesn't help now with that you should actually also be looking at your revenue. You don't want to completely ignore that. And you're just going to want to monitor that you're in line with your targets. And kind of, if you have more than one product or more than one service, track them also individually so that you can see if one is falling off or taking off. And then that will kind of help guide you in understanding what to offer next to your customers. Now, this third one is margin. And I just kind of have this as a generic margin, but there are many, many versions of margin, but it's all basically the same concept. These are your profitability ratios. And these are, re if you're only going to look at one thing outside of profit, look at your margin because you over time will get a very consistent margin. And that will tell, if that starts to deviate from the consistency, it will tell you that there's a problem. So what you're doing is you're taking net income and dividing it by your revenue and then turning that into a percentage. And what that is going to tell you is how much money of every dollar of sales you actually get to keep. So as an example, if your margin is 20%, then you're keeping 20 cents of every single dollar that you make. So your net income, just so everybody can hear this, is net is revenues minus your expenses. Now, when I said there's a whole bunch of them, depending on your company and your industry, you can track your gross profit margin, operating profit margin, pre-tax profit margins, and net margins. And an example of when you might want to switch it up and not look at bottom line margins, instead look at operating margins, is if you're like a product business and you want to track to make sure that your cost of goods sold isn't deviating too far. So you might track your operating margin and your net profit margin and to make sure that you've kind of got a hold on both of those. So after margin, another really great one is return on investment. Now this is another one that you can measure in various different areas, but you're gonna take your net profit and divide it by the cost of your investment and multiply that out by 100. What you're doing here is evaluating how good the investment was. So one place you can do this is in your marketing. 
and calculate out what the return on investment is. So if you're investing $100 a week in advertising, you would want to find out, okay, how much business is that actually bringing in and determine if it's a good return on your investment. You can also do that for like if you're buying equipment and a bunch of other things going into that. So that's another one you got to kind of pick depending on your industry. And another one that you can watch is your customer lifetime value. And this kind of goes hand in hand with your ROI and that you're looking to see how you bring on a client. It costs you $100 to bring them in, but on average, they're going to stick around and spend $2,000 with you. So you know by that customer lifetime value of $2,000 that you can kind of increase that advertising budget, or maybe you can't. So it really helps you understand what you need to do to stay even. And it can also help you evaluate new marketing tools as far as, um, you know, if I do this, can I use this as a loss leader knowing that on the back end they're going to be around for much longer? Great. So this one might be a little bit more exciting for our small business owners than, <laughs> <laughs> than all those boring number talks. <laughs> yeah, so this is your other big piece of advice is to pay yourself, the small business owner. Um, why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The first one is if you want to sell your business, if you are setting up and structuring your business that you can eventually sell it, in order for somebody, investor, to be interested in it, they want to ensure that there is a built-in salary in there for a manager. So if you are not paying yourself, but you're the one running the business and you turn around to try and sell it, you know, depending on your profit levels, it will, again, lower the value of your business and might even make it to a point that it's just not sellable. So if you're not paying yourself, and you're just kind of taking your income out of the profits like as a dividend, then that eliminates any benefits for a future purchaser. On the other hand, tying into the personal side, us business owners get stuck with the headache of having to go the extra mile any time that we want to buy a house or anything like that. We have all this extra work we have to do. However, if you're actually paying yourself and giving yourself a W-2 so that you can go, here's my pay stub and here it is in my account, um, it makes all of those processes a little bit easier. When you own a business, they still want to see it. But if you can say, no, here's my income, it makes it a little bit easier. Additionally, um, especially the older we are, if we're not paying ourselves actually through a payroll company, we don't get Social Security. So we want to do Social Security to do everything like that. So there's a lot of benefits to actually paying ourselves from the business that we don't even think about until it's too late. So those are just a couple of the reasons that you want to do that. So this might be a little intimidating, though. How do you recommend that people get started with setting that up officially? Well, the first recommendation I have is talk to your CPA. <laughs> Every business should have a really good CPA on their team. And I say this because when you're deciding how much to pay yourself, Depending on your corporate structure and industry and everything, there's certain requirements that the IRS has about underpaying yourself, overpaying yourself. They basically kind of want you to be in line with the industry. So they don't want you underpaying yourself and then taking a huge dividend. Um, and that can actually cause problems on that audit side too. So if you work with your CPA to kind of figure out how much to pay yourself, that really helps. But just to kind of give you some ideas of different ways that you can do it, you can do an industry standard wage. So let's say you own a programming company and you program and you do the management. You could pay yourself a programmer's salary at whatever level you're at and you would be fine. Now let's say you own that programming company and you do nothing but manage 
Well, then you could pay yourself like an office manager salary if that's what you're doing. And then depending on the size of the business, kind of the bigger it gets, that might have to go up a little bit to kind of get more to a CEO level. So that's one level way is just kind of look at what is your standard, standard industry wage for what you're doing. The other thing that you can do, depending on your business structure, is just pay yourself a commission. Um, I love this. I give myself a very, very small salary for management, and then I pay myself commission on any sales that I do. So that way I'm not tied into one salary. It can kind of ebb and flow as revenues go in and out every month. Uh, but again, I do have that kind of baseline that it's their minor, very minor <laughs> salary, and then pay myself commission from there. So once you've kind of figured out how much you want to pay yourself, I highly recommend you outsource all of the actual payment of it because in addition to just cutting the payroll, you have to worry about payroll taxes and getting that submitted and keeping everybody happy. So there are some services that make this a lot easier. You have your traditional ones like ADP and paychecks. But there's also all these really great new ones coming out that I'm super excited about because they make it really easy and really reasonably priced. Uh, my current favorite is one called Gusto. It's G-U-S-T-O, I think. I'm doing that from my head. Um, and it's all online. They can integrate with a 401k. You can do bonuses. You can do commission. You can do salary. It even, if you have employees, it will also do vacation tracking and holiday tracking and a bunch of other stuff. And then they fill out your tax, most of your tax forms for you. There's some states that kind of still want you to do some on your own. But besides that one, uh, QuickBooks has come out with their version of payroll. There's all these options. And then kind of going back to your CPA, most CPAs also offer payroll services and a lot of bookkeepers do too. So this isn't something that you really have to manage. You can decide what you're going to do and then turn it over to somebody else or use a service like Gusto that makes everything super, super easy to do. Okay, fourth big piece of advice, save for retirement. Um, you know, I think this is something a lot of, we you know whether a small business owner or not, this is something all of us hear a lot, um, but it is different if you're a small business owner. So uh, Andrea's gonna talk about, you know, again, some of the unique challenges small business owners face when it comes to this. Yes, business owners are, again, kind of put it at a disadvantage and disadvantage, but also we we don't think about it quite the same way. I talk to many business owners that are like, well, I'm just going to retire on how much I get from the sale of the business, or I'm going to wait till this next initiative launches, and it's going to be the big one that brings in all these cash, all this cash. I hear this all the time. The problem with this is, as soon as you have that great next big project that brings in all this cash, all of a sudden the entrepreneur in you goes, oh, wait, no, now I'm going to put the profits from that over here for this next great one, and then that's what I'm going to retire on. <laughs> so it's this perpetual cycle. And then with the selling of the business, most people don't realize this, but very few businesses are actually sold. I don't have accurate numbers anymore because I haven't looked lately, but I, as of a couple of years ago, it was like less than 40% actually sold. And that was including like turnover to family members. So the number goes even lower if you're looking at selling it just to a, a random person. So, a, and there's a lot of reasons why they don't sell, but most of them don't sell. And the ones that do sell, don't sell for anywhere near what the business owner really truly needs for retirement. So we are stuck with having to not only run our business and make sure everything's going great there, but if we really truly wanna retire and l continue to live the lifestyle that we're doing right now, we do have to plan and save outside of the business so that no matter what happens with the business, 
we've got money for retirement. So these are some of the different options. Um, and again, I'm sure, Andrea, you would tell our small business owners to, to get some one-on-one -on -one counseling when it comes to this, but okay, could you yes. just go over and uh, help people understand what these different options are? Yeah. Um, and before I kind of dive into these, you do, again, great to have a really good CPA on it because as I go through these, you'll see that each one has a, a different type of business that it's really great for, and that also depends on your finances. So your CPA can sit down and look at your numbers and, and just help you figure out which one's the best. So your first option is a solo 401k, and this is basically a 401k that is only you and you can add your spouse also, that's it. So if you're a one man shop or your spouse is working with you, have no employees and you want the high contribution limits and the profit sharing eligibility of the 401k, there is one called a solo 401k. So it's exact same thing except it's just you. The second one is a safe harbor 401k. And how this one is different from your solo one is that you can have employees. And it's called a safe harbor instead of a regular 401k because, because of the requirements that the IRS put in place, they don't do non-discrimination testing. So super short, regular 401ks at most companies have to go through this giant reporting and testing process that basically says our high income earners are not getting an unfair advantage in retirement savings. And so they'll cap them so that everything is equal across the board. Well, with the safe harbor plan, you don't have to go through all that testing. What you do have to do is there's required minimums on how much you contribute for your employees. So they give you two options. You can either uh, match dollar for dollar on like the first 4% that your employees put in, or you can contribute 3% for all employees, even if they're not doing the safe harbor. This is a really great one because it eliminates the paperwork. It keeps you on the 401k plan. It lets you do this for your employees, but then you still get those higher limits to put away even more money. The next one is a SEP. That stands for Simplified Employee Pension. And this is, it's not a pension, it's an IRA, <laughs> but that's what they're calling it. And the way that this one works is only the employer puts in. So if you have a team of five people, they cannot contribute, but you can contribute for them. And you can contribute up to 25% of your employees pay. And this is another reason why you want to be an employee too. So you can contribute um, to your own plan. Now, one thing that people really like about the SEP is there's almost no reporting requirements. They're very, very minimal. You open them up at a regular brokerage house with an IRA with options in them. And here's the kicker. You are not required to contribute the same amount every single year. So let's say you have a really, really seasonable business. Let's say you're in a tourist town and you know it, you're Business has to do with snowmobiling. Well, if you don't have snow one year, you kind of have a problem with revenues. This particular plan, you have those years, you can just say, we're not contributing this year or we're doing 5% this year. And then let's say you have a year where there's a ton of snow and you made a ton of money, you can go up to the full 25% for all the employees. So this one leaves you with a lot of flexibility. On the simple, this stands for Savings Incentive Match Plan for Employees. <laughs> Again, it's just an IRA that you open at a, a brokerage company. The difference between this one and the SEP is the simple allows your staff to contribute also. So if you want them to be able to put money away, this is a great one for that. 
you do either have to match up to 3% of their compensation um, for those putting money in or 2% for every eligible employee. And with this one, you have to do the same thing every year. There is no flexibility in it. Very, very similar to a 401k, except there's just not as many, much paperwork to do. So that's that one. The final one, and I only talk about this very briefly because it doesn't fit very many businesses, but you can still do the good old fashioned traditional pension plans. And this is really good for really high income businesses with small staff. So an example would be like a highly specialized doctor or attorney that they're bringing in a lot of money. They're, they're maxing out their 401k and still not putting a dent in any of the money that they're taking home. As long as you don't have too many employees to make this really cumbersome, you can save and, and have a lot more ready for retirement by looking into a pension. So if you meet those really high income, small office, it might be beneficial to find a pension provider. And then, oh, one more. I know we didn't have this on the list, but before we hit budgeting. <laughs> um, another thing to do is if you own your own business and your spouse has a, a regular job, you can do a lot of your retirement planning through their stuff and kind of just shift all the numbers over to that side so that you don't necessarily have to set up your own plan. But And it's good to do both, too. Yeah, that, that's good to know. So I'm sure um, our small business owners like knowing they have the option. So the last big step, big piece of advice is budgeting, and budgeting both for your business and for yourself. Now, Andrea, why do you recommend that our small business owners have both? Well, because if you're not doing a budget, you're basically not telling your money what to do. Most people get really freaked out when they hear the word budget and think that it's, it's going to tie them down. But the real purpose of a budget is to ensure that your money is getting spent where you actually want it spent. So it's much more of a, okay, I really value, you know, organic foods, retirement, and I love to travel. Well, then you would actually adjust your personal budget to ensure that those three things were included in it. So instead of, you know, spending, you know, a ton of money eating dinner out, you can go, oh, wait, no, this is my budget over here because I want to achieve this. So it's much more of a spending plan so that you get what you want from life. On the business side, I know it is so easy to get super excited about a new advertising thing, a new class, um, launching a new product, bringing on a new staff member, um, company parties. There's all these things that we can do with our funds. And if we haven't put together a business budget to ensure that we have the money for the marketing or that we've covered our lights and things like that, we can really quickly put ourselves out of business because we don't have a guideline to go by. So they're absolutely critical for keeping us on task and at the same time catching those problems. So as you're sitting down at your weekly numbers session and you're looking at your profit and loss statement and what you had forecasted for it, if you see that there's a, ver a large variance, you can figure out why that variance is there and make adjustments before it's too late. Well, like you said, budgeting can be a little scary for some people. So what are your tips? to make it less scary? Well, the first one that I say all the time is this does not have to be perfect. So take a deep breath, relax, and don't worry about it being perfect because the second you finish that plan, it's wrong. And if you go into it with that attitude, <laughs> it'll be a lot easier. But the reason that it's wrong almost instantly is because our budget is nothing more than what we're 
planning to happen. But since we don't have crystal balls, that's going to change constantly. It does get easier and easier to forecast what's going to happen. But if you sit down and do a profit and loss projection and pick up the phone and find out that you just landed the big, biggest client you've ever had that you didn't even know the person was looking at your company. Well, guess what? <laughs> you have to go back and redo your profit and loss statement. So don't worry about it being perfect. Remember, it's just a guideline so that you can monitor what's going on. Uh, the other one is don't let unpredictable income stop you from budgeting. I hear this so many times from small business owners, especially in those first five years as they're trying to grow and income really can be unpredictable. Don't use that as a reason to not budget because that's actually the time you have to be budgeting. And something that you can do to kind of work around this is ignore the traditional advice of like a zero sum budget and do something more like a cash flow budget. And this would be you're just keeping track of, okay, here's how much is my checking account. Here's all my expenses that I have to pay over the next 30 days and then keep them in priority and date order. And then as cash comes in, you go back to that sheet and, and cover what needs to be covered and input a little extra for fun, but always ch watching the cash flow. Since your business cash flow is going to be unpredictable, thus your personal is unpredictable, paying stuff from a cash flow perspective makes it a lot easier. The other thing that you can do is this doesn't need to be done uh, by hand. It can if you want to. I actually think there's big benefits to doing it by hand, <laughs> um, but you don't have to do it by hand. You don't have to use Excel if you don't want to use Excel because there's really great programs out there that will help you do it. So on the business side, most bookkeeping softwares have a budgeting function in it where you can key in your projections and then it will do a comparison for you. So a couple of my favorites are Xero and QuickBooks, whether it's the online or the desktop version. Those will make automate everything for you so that you're not doing anything by hand or into Excel. On the personal side, there's a few options. You have mint.com, which just uploads everything, and you can set up alerts for you, it to tell you when you're going over on a particular you know, setting, whether you've ate out too much or whatever. There's also personal capital. This one is probably better for those who already have a really a larger investment portfolio because it has a large investment component. Um, for somebody who wants just invest or sorry, just budgeting, there's a software called YNAB. It's YNAB. It's you need a budget. Y N A B, and that is purely focused on the budgeting process. And then Quicken. So those make it so much easier if you switch over to using an electronic format. Great. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. We've just covered her big, you know, five big concepts and, and strategies for small business owners specifically to help take control of their money. Hopefully you've learned a lot, but you may also have some questions. So we are going to move into our Q&A now. And as a reminder, if you have a question, just click over to the Ask a Question tab uh, and type it in. And we already have some coming in from the audience. Uh, so Andrea, going back to the first piece of advice, um, someone said, if there is commingling, can I still resolve it by starting to, you know, starting now, separating the business and personal expenses, or is it too late? It's never too late. <laughs> you can start right now. Um, I actually just had a new client come on about a month ago, and he just started in May and had been commingling everything this whole time. Um, and we got everything separated out, and now going forward, it's all separate. And kind of in line with that, there are times that when we're busy and in life, we grab the wrong card. We're out at Office Depot and we accidentally grab the wrong card. Well, if you grab your personal card and it's a business expense, just submit an expense report to your bookkeeper for yourself and reimburse yourself. It's more about making that process 
um, very detailed. So you attach the receipt to an expense report and then you're good to go. If you do it the other way, like where it's um, you're using a business card for the personal, that is going to depend on what type of like structure entity you are. If you're like an LLC or a sole proprietor, it's easier because you can do like an owner's draw. If you're a corporation, then you'll want to check in with your bookkeeper to figure out the best way to do that, whether that's an additional capital or whatever that setup is. But it is never too late to get all that stuff separate. Great. So we have someone who is asking, I think they're referring to the ROI, return on investment formula. Could you just repeat that for everybody? Uh, the ROI one? Um, ROI is your return on investment. It's just whatever you, the net profit divided by the cost of investment, cost of investment times 100. The other one that we talked about was the margin, and that one is net income divided by revenue and multiplied by 100. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have someone else who's asking, you know, you mentioned some great web-based tools, but uh, we have someone who's wondering, you know, do you have a template or a template you recommend for creating a budget? To me, this is a very personal thing. Um, I have my cash flow template that I personally use. Um, other than that, what I recommend is people just go Google, Google Excel, you know, budget tools or Excel forms. They're all over the place that you can get access to. Great. And, you know, I, I would also say to the audience, you know, remember, it doesn't have to be perfect, and that means, you know, I yep. think it's okay to experiment with some different things. Like maybe you try one, but you know, budget template, and it's not working for you, you know, go try another. I mean. Absolutely. Personalize it. <laughs> well, and kind um, of with that, so like when I was going through those personal budgeting software programs, I literally have tried every single one of them. One, because I like to play with new software, but – even though I've been on Quicken forever, every time a new one comes out, I'm like, well, let's see if it's better than the last one. And I give it a whirl and try it. And that's how you find the one that's right for you. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a few different people asking some questions related to um, the retirement. Uh, and it looks like for a lot of our small business owners, they really do have a very small number of employees, you know, maybe mm -hmm. three employees, five, ten. Um, could you, what do you recommend for those very small employee businesses? Or would you say, you know, you really need to find a good CPA? And do you have any advice for, for that? You know, you do really need a good CPA because what deciding between a safe harbor 401k, a SEP, and a simple is going to come down to the seasonality of your business. Um, are your employees part time? Are they lifers? How much revenue do you have? Like, how what is the contribution level going to be? What are the fees that you're looking at? It really is something that. And let's say you call a financial advisor and are like, um, you know, I have three employees and I make fifty thousand a year, and they say, oh, you have to be in a safe harbor. I would run from that person <laughs> because they need to actually yeah. look at your business. Um, to figure out what one is the best for you. If you don't have a CPA or a financial advisor, I usually say start with the CPA and not the financial advisor because CPAs tend to approach it from a very different perspective than their advisor, and a lot of advisors are not familiar with the business options. And even if they are, they can come from a very sales-focused place. There's not many out there that come from an authentic place of understanding finance and wanting to help you, whereas your CPA understands the laws and what is required from the IRS for every single investment option, and they have your numbers. So they're not necessarily looking at, well, I can put you in this highly commissioned account over here. They're looking at, 
you know, what's going to be the best bet for you this year, but then also going forward because um, like your SEP, you cannot have any other plant. So if you start a SEP and then, you know, decide to go to a 401k later, you basically have to kind of eliminate the old program. So there's all these like, I got your rules that the IRS has that only a really good CPA will know all of them. Great. So we have another small business owner who's asking, you know, they said they've been running their small business for several years and things are a little messy. They really want to get a clean start. What's mm-hmm. the best way for them to do that? Well, I guess I would have to know what messy means. Messy as in like the books are messy or... Are, um, this person saying the books are a mess. They use QuickBooks, but they want a clean start. They want a clean start. Uh, there's a couple ways to do that. You can just start a brand new file. Um, typically, the best time to do that would be like a, a year cut over. So if you're on QuickBooks, and you want to get everything cleaned up, I would say in 2017, start a new QuickBooks file. Um, The other thing that you can do is if you're considering switching softwares, it's that you can clean stuff up that way. So I actually have a client doing that right now. We brought on a new CPA, and we are converting from QuickBooks over to Xero, and in the process, the CPA is going through and cleaning up Um, the accounting structure and all the different accounts and making it easier to manage. So um, I would make a decision on which software you want to go with and how you want to proceed and then do that cutover for January. Great. We have someone else who's wondering, uh, maybe they didn't quite understand or just want you to refresh, go back and explain the customer lifetime value. Uh, And that was one of those things that you pointed out earlier. It's like if you're checking over your business financials, you definitely want to maybe look at look at that. Well, in another you might hear it just referred to as CLV. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to take a look at all of your customers or let's say you have multiple services. Maybe you want to break it out by service, but you're going to look at your customer and go on average. My customers stick around for 12 months, and on average, they bring me $3,000. And this could be very different for a lot of things. Let's say you're an online business and have a continue, a continuity program where, you know, it's 20 bucks every single month. Well, you want to go 20 times the average length that the person stays, and then that will kind of tell you your their lifetime value. Um, and then using that number will help you figure out how much – money you can spend per customer on marketing, um, if you need to raise prices, et cetera. But basically just kind of figure out how many months is a customer typically around and how much are you bringing in from that customer. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, A few people are wondering if you could actually uh, just quickly repeat some of the web-based budgeting tools you mentioned just a little while ago, some of those business and personal. Yep, absolutely. Um, for the business side, Zero uh, is a good one. And it's not it's not zero as in Z, it's X-E-R-O. And that one is cloud-based. And I will tell you, every time I log into it for a client, I go, why am I not on this? <laughs> um, It is a newer one. It's actually a New Zealand company. They just came over into the U.S. a couple of years ago. And while it's not quite as robust as the QuickBooks desktop version, but they keep adding stuff. Every time I log in, there's a new report available. Their help section is great. Um, The other standby is QuickBooks. They have an online version also, and they have the desktop version The thing I love about QuickBooks is it does have um, a lot more functionality on the desktop one, but it's also really easy to navigate. Zero is too, but QuickBooks kind of does this like almost step-by-step through thing. Um, And there are other business ones out there, but I think those two are the best for most small businesses. On the personal side, there's Mint, 
There's one called Personal Capital. Uh, there's one called YNAB. It's Y-N-A-B. It stands for You Need a Budget. And then the other one is Quicken. Great. So we definitely encourage everybody to check those out, see what works best for you. Uh, now we have a question from an audience member, Andrea, about sort of this issue of, of paying yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. And you addressed this a little bit, I think, earlier, but she's wondering, you know, how do you suggest owners draw as an LLC when the work is seasonal? Says This person says, I'm never sure whether to take a large draw when things are good or keep it in the business account until later. Well, this is another one that you really want to kind of talk with your CPA about. However, what I say with seasonal businesses is you want to be very careful that you have enough money in there for those low seasons. So what you might do with a situation like that is pay yourself, you know, kind of a lower salary, kind of exactly what you need, and then, you know, maybe right at right before you actually go into good season if there's a bunch of extra money you know take a little bit out kind of you you're going to want to evaluate it more and it's okay if you're at LLC taking an owner's draw it's not like you can only do it once a month you know so if you're seasonal pay yourself the basics to keep your personal side going in and when i say basics in my world, that also means you've budgeted in like retirement money and emergency fund money and everything like that. That's not just how do I, you know, keep the lights on and the heat on. It's you want to, you're in business so that you can live and live a good life. So make sure you're budgeting in investment money too. Yeah. Do you have any additional advice for a small business owner who hears this webinar and says, you know, I really I hear that I hear you on the retirement, but I just I can't manage that right now. What would you say to that person? When are you going to manage it? Yeah, I always start with that question because oh later I got plenty of time, plenty of time. Um, unfortunately, I've seen the flip side, and life happens before you think it's going to happen. Um, I know a ton of people who I'm going to work forever. I'm in love with what I do, and a major heart attack takes them out. They can't work anymore. They physically cannot work anymore. Um, the statistics on a person becoming disabled before like the age of 62 is astronomical. So in addition to that, mathematically, the earlier you start, the less you have to save. So if you really, really think that, oh, you can worry about that later, I always say, Come on, start with 25 a month. Start with 100 a month. Get yourself started, or chances are you're not going to get yourself started until it's way too late. Yeah. Great. Well, that's about all the time we have for Q&A. But, Andrea, before we wrap up, do you have any recommendations for our listeners who want to learn more, any sort of follow-up resources, that kind of thing? You know, I think if you want to learn more, reach out, I know I've said this a zillion times, reach out to a good CPA, um, find somebody that you trust, maybe a mentor from an existing business, ask your bookkeeper questions, just be willing to learn about it. It is a different language. Investing and the finance world on the business side is just a different language. So it's like you're starting from scratch and starting new. So keep attending webinars. Get a money magazine and start reading through things like that and just keep on educating yourself. Um, as far as those basics of getting set up, and I think I saw that you had added this in the attachments and links, but um, I put together like a three-part series on how to get your accounts separated, how to get the accounting softwares in place and every and how to do the PL budget. So it gives you kind of something to get started with on that business side. Yeah, great. Yes, that is in the attachment section of this webinar. So everyone, please go check that out. Uh, it has lots more great information again to kind of help you get started. Uh, it's about time for us to wrap up, but I want to thank you, Andrea, so much for uh, generously donating your time today and uh, sharing your expertise. We really appreciate it. Thank you.
Uh, everyone listening, if you want to revisit any part of this webinar, something you want to go back, uh, re-listen to, it will be available for on-demand viewing within 24 hours. Uh, and again, be sure to check out that attachment tab. It has some extra materials, not just from Andrea, but also from our sponsor, Avalara. So before we wrap up, I do also want to thank Avalara again for sponsoring today's event. And thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation.